lift you, but I pray for you that your faith not fail. Then before that, we, um, or after that, we understand that all the disciples work with the area of faith in the epistles, speaking of faith. Uh, Sheila, do we have a class tonight? Okay, what ages? Okay, Lord bless the children and our wonderful teachers. Amen. We let the teachers slide out. Thank you, Rhea. Thank you, guys. I love the children. Amen. Palm Sunday. I can't say. Uh, uh, Bishop Miller was in Denton, Texas, preaching this morning, the 10th anniversary. Uh, he's been with us several times, always brings a, a, a timely word. I enjoy hearing him. There's a diversification of the men and women that we bring into this house. Last week, Ken Holloway was here. Can't get much diverse than Ken. You know, y'all went down and saw Ken, didn't you? Hey, Amen. I, Bishop, this one problems I got. Joey, this one problems I got. You, 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 you musicians, you singers, repeat songs over and over, and the people just applaud and go on and on. And we go to concerts to hear the same songs that we already have the, uh, the uh, uh, MP3 of, you know. And I mean, we'll just hear the same songs. But if I dare get up and preach the same sermon twice, I'm lazy. I'm lazy. But what's neat, after 14 years, and some of you have been with me 18 and longer, you could almost quote my stuff. And you know I got to go back and share it again, Donna Cheryl, because there's new people here in the house, and we got to go, it's three steps forward, two steps back. So we got to do it. Uh, first time I heard Joey Hughes sing, uh, I was blown away, because sometimes you'll look at somebody and you judge them by their looks. I don't mean I don't mean that bad, Joey. And when I heard his story about where he came from and how he was raised up, I saw, my goodness, what a tremendous miracle God has done in this young man's life. Joey is uh, sought after all over the country. I was shocked. I really was when you said he was coming, and because uh, I, I love to hear Joey, I love to hear you preach too, Bishop. But I go up there sometimes just to get my praise on with you guys. And, uh, I love you so. Take your liberty for a song or two here, if you would. Amen, and then we'll have Bishop come up. Many of you know Jesus has won the victory. He has no rival. He has no equal. So we sing it like this. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Hallelujah. You have won it all for me. And death could not hold you down. stripes we are healed by his nail pierced hands we're free by his blood we're washed clean now we have the victory oh the power of sin Yeah. 
Our God is risen. He is alive. He's won the victory. He reigns on high. Come and sing. Our God is risen. He is alive. He's won the victory. He reigns on high. Our God. Our God is risen.
we're standing here only because you may say this you made a way come on sing it you made a way I'm standing here only because you made a way. Lord, I'm standing here only because you made a way. Thank you for making a way for you tonight. Thank you. For us, Lord, we bless you in this place. Praise the Lord. Why don't you just be seated for just a minute? Well, good evening, everyone. Try that one more time. Good evening, everyone. It's a great delight to be back in Crosby tonight and um, to be with Pastor Jerry and Lori in this wonderful church. I always have valued my relationship with them, and uh, it's been a joy for me to be able to come. I, I get the privilege of preaching all over the world. There's no, no place in the world like the Little Country Church. There's no place in the world like the Little Country Church. I preach in a lot of large, massive churches, and, but uh, there's something about the Little Country Church. There's just an authentic reality of faith honesty and purity it always blesses my heart when i come here i asked joey if he'd stay at the keyboard for just a minute i just sent him a text because i'm i asked him to do something about a year ago a little over a year ago a year and a half ago before we got into the political climate we're in today i guess it had begun god just gave me a strong word one day and i went to our church and i shared that word i said I hear the Holy Spirit saying that we're about to come into a season of disruption and there will be interruptions in people's lives. Now, how many of you know everybody loves miracles? Nobody loves interruptions. And about 75% of all the miracles in the New Testament that Jesus performed were the result of an inter interruption. He was going somewhere and somebody interrupted him. And the disruption that is going on the earth, I just came back last Saturday night from Israel. I'd been in uh, the UK the week before that doing a conference with business leaders and, and leaders from the nation. Actually very, very wealthy people. There was a couple billionaires that I spent two days with just trying to talk about where is the future of that nation going. And they're right in the middle of Brexit and trying to figure out what they're going to do about the EU and what the nation is going to look like and all the disruption that's gone on. And I realized that we are in the middle of a season of disruption. Nobody knows what the future is going to look like. Nobody even knows what tomorrow morning's news is going to look like. Come on, how many of you get up every morning going, I didn't think I'd ever see that. Jordan is my son-in-law and, and um, he was with me in, in England and I had another staff guy, and so they were literally on the bridge in London less than 24 hours from the time that the, the guy ran across the bridge and killed five people and tried to get into the apartment house. They were there on that bridge the day before, right as he was, got ready to do that. 
And you realize that disruptions come. And here's why, here's why the enemy tries to disrupt your life. Because if he can throw you through a disruption, he'll cause you to let loose of your faith. The fight of your life, ladies and gentlemen, is not for your stuff. The devil doesn't need your car. He doesn't need your house. He doesn't need your job. He's not after the things we fight so much to keep. He's not after your stuff. What he's after is your faith. Because if you throw in your faith, you lose the ability to overcome. 1 John 5, 4 says, Everything born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. Hmm? So how many of you recognize tonight what he targets is your faith? He tries to target that through disappointment. He tries to target it through delay. He tries to target it through disruptions. Anybody in the room ever had life show up in your house that you wasn't expecting? It wasn't on your day planner? Hmm? Just all of a sudden your life got disrupted? And the Bible says this. I'm going to talk in just a minute about something about, about somebody that was expecting something to happen that didn't happen. And what God told them to do in the midst of that. But listen to me closely. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That's what the book of Hebrews chapter 12 says this. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. So that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. So everything in your life that gets shaky and seems like it begins to shake, rattle, and roll. How many of you recognize these, they're only being shaken because they can be? But there's some things in your life that cannot be shaken. There's some things, no matter who comes, who goes, what comes, what goes, they cannot be shaken. And in the midst of, of all of that, one of the things I recognize is that our nation and our generation is crying for hope. I got three helpers. It's the people are crying for hope. Hope is the earnest expectation of something good. That's the definition of hope. It's the earnest expectation of something good. It is the belief that something good is coming my way. Well, Roberts used to say, something good is going to happen to me today. Hallelujah. I mean, you know, that's hope. That means that when I get up in the morning, I believe something good is coming my way. He also said this. He said, every day of your life, a miracle is either coming to you or going by you. Mm -hmm. And it's all predicated on your expectation. So hope says, I've set my hope on God. And that in every situation of my life, something good is going to happen to my life. And a few years ago, I hosted an event. Uh, our, our team, our staff hosted an event in Oklahoma City because... We, I, I have an assignment on my life. I, I spend time not only preaching, but I also spend time with major leaders across not only the nation, but across the world. Sometimes those leaders are major political leaders. I'll be invited in by a prime minister or president of a nation or a cabinet member to come and spend time with guys in, in nations that are experiencing great disruptions. And a few, not, not long ago, I was in Jamaica and the prime minister had asked me to come. I spent it. I spent time with 160 of the top businessmen and the cabinet of that nation. I spent two days there. In fact, there's only two companies in all of, the, all of Jamaica that's, that sells on the New York Stock Exchange. And both of them were in the meeting, the men that own those companies. And I taught for two days on this subject that we've got to restore a culture of honor. It's the culture of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. How many of you know the Bible? The Bi Am I doing all right? Can I keep going? Because I'm, I'm just setting up something. I'm not preaching yet. Don't count this against my time, okay? I'll preach in a minute. But the culture of honor is the culture of the kingdom. Peter says it this way, honor all men and honor the king. Now, how many of you know for us, we can say, well, if that means if my man's in power, I can honor him. It's not my man in power. I won't honor him. But Peter said that when Nero was ruling the Roman Empire. And Nero was burning Christians at the stake. 
and feeding them to lions in the Roman Colosseum. And here's what Peter said. If you want to be a Christian, learn the culture of honor. Honor all men and even honor the king. See, because here's what honor says. Honor says that I'm going to honor you for who you are without tripping over who you're not. Hmm? Honor says I honor you or I respect you over who you are without tripping over who you're not. How many of you know most of the time when we meet people, we only value what we find them to be and we disvalue them for all the things we think they should have been? Hmm? But honor says this, I'm not going to get hung up over what you're not. I'm going to honor you for who you are. Honor is not respect. You earn respect, but you give honor. Hmm? I can honor you and not agree with you. You don't, if you don't say amen right there, you've never been married a day in your life. <laughs> hmm? Do you realize honor of the Ten Commandments, honor is the only commandment that Jesus, that God the Father gave that has a promise to it. None of the other nine commandments have a promise. God does not tell you that if you won't steal, you'll be prosperous. He doesn't tell you that if you don't commit adultery, you'll have a great marriage. But he tells you this, if you honor your father and your mother, it will go well with you and your days will be long upon the earth. He didn't even say honor the good ones. Hmm? He didn't qualify it. Your daddy may have left when you was two years old and you've never seen him, but here's what the Bible says. The Bible says the kingdom has a culture of honor. And when honor is restored, it raises the expectation of supernatural activity. These three nights, I felt like when Pastor Jerry said, where do you feel like you're going to go? I said, I feel like God's about to release a whole other realm of faith at the Little Country Church. I believe there are dreams that are about to be dreamed that have never been dreamt. I believe families are about to experience breakthroughs that have never experienced breakthroughs in their entire life. I got about four helpers. Come on. I, anybody believe in what I'm talking about? I believe, I believe that people are about to get saved in your family that you didn't think would ever get saved. Hmm? I believe this whole region is about to experience a major outpouring of God's Spirit. But faith is the substance of things hoped for. A guy said to me one day, I stand in a prayer line. He said, Bishop, will you pray for my faith? He said, man, my hope has been gone. I, I, don't have any, I don't have any hope at all. I said, well, if your hope left, your, fra- your faith left weeks ago. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. So as you and I begin to recognize that honor releases an atmosphere for God to begin to put expectancy in people's hearts. Am I doing all right? Hmm? And I just believe tonight, a couple of years ago, when we, I hosted an event in Oklahoma City where we just had all of our government officials come and it was called Let Hope Reign. Because I believe in the midst of all of our despair, somebody has got to believe for hope. Somebody's got to stand up and say, in the midst of all the confusion, the polarization, all of the battles that are taking place, somebody's going to believe that hope is going to begin to reign in the midst of us. And for that event, Joey wrote a song that just became an incredible blessing to our house. And just before I preach tonight, I asked him, would he sing it? Because I believe for some of you in this room, it's hard for you to have faith because your hope's gone. You don't even, you don't even get up every day expecting it to come. For some of you in this room, you have learned to live with it. You've just said, I'm going to have to live with it. It's the way it is. Sort of, you got, you're sort of a Kenny Rogers kind of Christian. You got to know when to hold them, got to know when to fold them. That's done. But if this week means anything, if dead people can get up and come back to life, It doesn't matter how much your dream has died and your hope has died. God can be the wellspring of hope on the inside of you and faith 
can begin to bring miracles into your life once again. Hallelujah. So, Pastor Joy, just sing for us, would you? Let hope ring. All across this nation, fear's taken hold. From every generation, from the young up to the old. There's a cry for something different, something real to hold on to. A solid, firm foundation that only comes from you. So let hope reign in our nation. Let hope reign in this land. From the high rise to the hilltops, Lord, extend your mighty hand. We have heard the call to freedom. We will rise to take a stand. And in these times of desperation, we will say, let hope Come on, stand with me all over the building, would you? Hallelujah. Thank you, Joy. Would you open your Bibles with me tonight? I hope you brought your Bible with you. Whether you got it in paper or got it on your phone or somewhere. 2 Kings chapter 3. 
2 Kings chapter 3. Joyce, you going to be with us Tuesday night too? You're going to be here Tuesday night as well, right? Oh, that's great. What is that? I don't know what the people that hang out with me do. I just sort of, I pastor, I don't know. I don't know. Praise the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 3. Just a very short passage of scripture. Beginning in verse number 9. So, so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on the round about seven days, and there was no water for the army nor the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of his servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphath, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. Surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus says the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For the Lord says, You'll not see wind, nor will you see rain. Yet the valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Somebody say, it's a simple matter. It's a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. Father, I pray over these next few minutes that you'll saturate this room with your presence. I pray, Lord, for an anointing to deliver the word, but thank you for an anointing to hear the word. May it bear fruit, and may that fruit remain tonight. In Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen. Amen. High five three people and tell them, are you ready to dig ditches? Come on, just tell them. Just look at them. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. If you give me just a few minutes, I just want to develop a couple of thoughts here. I know you've been in church already today and everybody's got to work tomorrow. But if you give me just a few minutes, you came, so we might as well do this right. Come on. Hallelujah. Think about this. I'd like for you to finish this sentence in your own mind. My life would be happier, it'd be easier, it'd be better if I had, fill in the blank, if I had more money, if I had more time, if I had more hair, <laughs> if I had better health. If I had a husband, if I didn't have a husband, <laughs> my life would be happier, it'd be easier, it would be better if I had a job. You can fill in the blank and we could go on forever for the next hour filling in that blank because see, most people tonight believe that their life is focused on what they're lacking, not what they have. The amazing thing is, listen to me closely. How many of you know that gratitude always changes your perspective? If you feel like your perspective is out of whack, gratitude will always change your perspective because how many of you know your perspective is most of the time based on where you're sitting? I ain't got no help. Let me try that again. Perspective is most of the time based on where you're sitting. Somebody sitting in the back of this building doesn't see the same thing as somebody sitting in the front of this building. Because where you sit determines what you perceive. And we receive the way we perceive. I'll try that again. In life, it's a principle in the kingdom that people receive the way they are even perceived. In fact, it was true of Jesus. The way people perceived him is how they received from him. Jesus went to a woman at a well in Samaria and he sat down to ask for a drink of water. She starts a conversation about religion. He begins to answer her about her history and about what God wants to do in her life. She makes this statement. 
I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now, before she gets done, she probably wished she'd have perceived something else. Because he said to her, she said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Jesus said, okay, you think I'm a prophet? Then I'll prophesy. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with is not your husband. I mean, you know, she probably wished she'd have perceived a teacher. Come on. But she received the way she perceived. Her life was radically changed. Jesus, listen, Jesus never tells the truth to make people feel derog- in a derogatory way nor to belittle them. Truth, when Jesus tells it, never makes somebody feel little. When Jesus delivers the truth, it's only to make them feel liberated so they can become what he intended them to be. She ends up having her life changed, goes back into the city, and the whole city shows up. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said, I perceive that thou art a teacher sent from God. Nicodemus said, I perceive you're a teacher. Jesus said, okay, I'll teach you. Sit down, I'll teach you about how to enter the kingdom. Unless a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And he taught him how the kingdom operates. Because we receive the way we perceive. Do you know what that means? That means if you get up every day believing nothing's going to happen, how many of you know what will probably happen in your life is nothing? The person who believes they can and the person who believes they can't are both right. Come on, I'll try that one more time. I mean, you know, the person who believes they can and the person who believes they can't are both right. Right. Hmm? If you can be denied, you will be. Because you receive the way you perceive. The reality is it's not how big your problems are, it's how you view your problems. If you recognize your problems are nothing in comparison to your God, how many of you know then it won't matter how big your problems are? Because no mountain is bigger than he is. Pastor Joey sang it tonight. He has no equal and he has no rival. There's nothing he can't do. Come on, somebody. Jesse DePlantis, my friend, said to me one day, he said, Tony, it doesn't take any more faith to live out of the overflow than the bottom of the barrel. Huh? If you're going to live by faith, you might as well live in the overflow. Amen. I'm feeling good myself. I'm going to preach to myself. Very good, Pastor Tony. Go ahead. Preach. Glory. Woo! I think I'll play the drums. Amen. Boom. We'll just get a cymbal right there. Hallelujah. Because I believe you can live out of the overflow just as easy as you can live out of the bottom of the barrel. It's determined by what you perceive. Three kings had come together believing that they were going to go to war, but something didn't happen the way they expected it. These three kings thought they would have a cakewalk through this battle. They would take credit. Almost what Pastor Jerry was talking about tonight. They thought they were self-sufficient. They would take care of this enemy. They'd walk through it like a piece of cake, be done, and go back home. The only problem is when they started out across the desert, they had gotten seven days in a journey and had not found water anywhere. And they had all these men, all these animals, all these horses, all the camels, and nothing had had water for seven days. And how many of you know, when life does not work the way you thought it was going to work, it can become very, very frustrating. Hmm? So what happens is these three guys get together and they come up with the bright idea, God has brought us out here to kill us. Anybody in the room ever felt like what you're going through, God has set up to kill you? May I help somebody tonight? If God wants to kill you, he rarely misses. Come on. The truth of the matter is, if God wanted to take you out, that wouldn't be hard. Huh? So if something is going on, you have to learn to perceive the situation different than just trying to find out where to place blame. Don't miss what I'm about to say. If you're taking notes, write this down. Any need that drives you to depend on God is actually a blessing. Hmm. Any, any, any need, any problem... Any difficulty that drives you to depend on God is not a curse. It's a blessing. Hallelujah. See, it's amazing how often we believe that God has forsaken us, forgotten us, because we misread our circumstances. See, I don't believe God does anything without intention. For most of us, it's about arriving at a destination. For God, it's about means to a destination. God is more interested in the means of how he gets you there than the fact that you got there. Because everything, 
Don't miss what I'm about to say. Everything God does, he does with intention. Hmm? Am I doing all right? So you know what that means? That means if he acts, he meant to act. He did it with intention. So that also means if he didn't act, he meant to not act. He did it with intention. But I mean, you know, most of us really have a great praise life when he acts the way we thought he should have acted. Huh? Because we say, look at God. Ain't God good? He did exactly what I thought he was going to do. He was intentional. I knew that's what he was going to do. Praise the Lord. But how many of you know our praise dies out, our, our, our whole smiles leave our face when God doesn't do what we thought he was going to do because we can't believe he did that intentionally. But every now and then God says, I'm going to not act because I'm going to bring you closer to me. Watch this. I'm not going to let those plans work because I got bigger plans for you. And if those plans had worked, I couldn't bring you to what I really have for you. There are some things, ladies and gentlemen, that I prayed for about 10 years ago. I am grateful tonight God didn't answer. There are some girls when I was in college I prayed for. I am grateful. Come on, somebody. God did not answer my prayer. But what I found is this, is that when God doesn't allow my plans to succeed, it's because he has bigger plans. So these kings got together and they decided, we're going to go whip the king of Moab. And they get down there, they have no water, now they're mad. And one of the kings comes up with a bright idea. He said, is there not a prophet somewhere? We need a prophet. Sounds like most church people. We get a problem, now I want to hear from a prophet. Hmm? Up until we had the problem, we didn't care about hearing from the prophet. Come on. Huh? Watch this. He said, is there not a prophet somewhere? And Jehoshaphat said, there is one down. I know about him. He's down in, Israel. He's down in Judah. Elisha is down there. So he gets the kings together and they all go down there. I love, I love, I can't wait to get to him to meet Elisha because he's got a little bit of like my personality. He's sarcastic and he's a little bit sideways. So they get down there and when they get to Elisha's tent, they tell him three kings are there. And he says, big deal. In fact, when he finally walks out, the king said, we've got a big problem. And you need to do something. And Elisha basically said, oh, now you want to hear what the preacher's got to say. Mm -hmm. When you hell bent on having your way, you didn't care what I said. I am really preaching good tonight. Yes, in Christ. Come on. Huh? But now that everything you've tried to work out is busted and not going right, now you want to come find out what I want to say, what God's got to say. And then he looks at him and says this. And there's three kings sat in there, and he looks at him and says, I just want to tell you something. If it were not for the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even listen to you other two suckers. In other words, I'm going to regard the guy who is the praiser. He's the king of Judah. I'm going to regard the praiser, even though he's not praising right now because he thinks the whole world's falling apart. I'm going to regard the praiser. And you guys are going to be the benefactor of somebody else who's, who's called to be a praiser. I wonder how many times you've come in church, your world was falling apart, you had no expectation, you had no hope for anything, your faith was dead in the water, and somebody sitting on a pew began to praise for you, and God overlooked your craziness, and he overlooked your stubbornness, and he regarded their praise and sent you a miracle. Hallelujah. That's why it's important to be in the right kind of church and the right kind of environment because you never know when somebody else's praise is about to get you a breakthrough. Come on. Come on. Come on. And you never know when you're praising who you might be praising for. No, I, 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 that, that deserves a whole lot better shout than that. Sometimes you say, well, I don't, I don't have any real needs. I don't, why am I going? No, no, no. You go crazy in worship because there might be somebody sitting two pews behind you that is on the verge of a breakdown and they need somebody that can get a word from God. And God will regard Jehoshaphat and give you an answer. Hmm? Now, how many of you know when you're desperate for an answer, you're sold in a hurry? Maybe not, in, maybe not in Crosby, Texas, but in Oklahoma City it's that way. 
And anybody ever prayed, God, I need an answer yesterday? So they look at Elisha and said, Elisha, we, we, we want to hear from God. And, and Elisha, he goes, okay, bring me a minstrel, a musician. And those three kings go, we got armies trying to kill us. And you want R&B. <laughs> what is wrong with you? What do you mean a musician? He said, get me a musician. Because in the Old Testament, there was a picture of something how God operates. And in the midst of music being played, the prophetic gift in the heart of the prophet would get stirred up. So they would call for music to be played, and it would activate the prophetic word in them. Right, right. What are you saying, Bishop? Here's what I'm saying. There's certain atmospheres that activate another level of faith in you. Hmm? If you want to change your future, sometimes you've got to change your atmosphere. Hmm? Come on now. Now, how many of you know, if you keep hanging out with everybody that's depressed and mad and frustrated, huh? boo-boo and Bubba down on the corner, and Bubba's he's dumb as a bag of rocks. He don't know nothing. And everybody, how many of you know everybody on the corner going to be dumb as a bag of rocks? Because the truth of the matter is, if you want to activate another level of faith in your life, you have to shift the atmosphere of your life. And Elisha said, here's what I need to do. I need to shift this atmosphere. I need a minstrel. Somebody go and begin to sing or play the song of Zion. Because out of that music began to flow an anointing that released a prophetic word. And listen, when you get a word from God, that's all you need. You don't need anything else. And as he began to play and began to sing of worship, God gave a word. Here's the second thing I want you to hear tonight. First thing is anything, any need that makes you grow closer to God is not a curse, it's a blessing. The second thing is this. Every word from God will give you a simple instruction. Every word from God will give you a simple instruction. Listen to me closely. Faith is always activated by obedience to a simple instruction. Your miracle is on the other side of obedience to a simple instruction. We wait on God to tell us hard things to do. We need a healing from cancer in our body. We wait on God to tell us, I want you to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Do something difficult. But the truth of the matter is, your miracle's on the other side of a simp an obedience to a simple request, a simple instruction. Faith always brings an instruction. We'll try that again. Faith always brings an instruction. And Elisha said this. Here's the instruction. Make this valley full of ditches now hold on hold on to your seat watch this if, if, how many of you want God to increase your faith let me see your hand come on hold your hand up high if you want God to increase I do I want God to increase my faith here's what Elisha said to them he said God's going to give you another level of faith and give you the miracle you're looking for but watch this it's going to begin with work he basically said this show me your faith by your work and I will show you my faithfulness how often have we wanted God to be faithful but we haven't wanted to show our faith by doing what he said hmm? and in the midst of him operating in faith and doing the simple instructions that God said to him watch this can I, can I say this tonight here most of the time, faith is not glowing in the dark when you sleep. Faith is not somebody that walks around with angels flying over top of them. People that really operate in faith. Do you know who the people are that really operate in faith? That's the people that keep showing up every week doing the same yes. thing because they're faithful to what God said to them. When you get to heaven, Jesus is not going to say, Well done, thou good and talented servant. 
Huh? He won't say, well done, thou good and successful servant. He will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. In other words, I was given an instruction to dig ditches. I'm going to dig ditches. I was given an instruction to not forsake the assembling of myself together. I'm going to be in the house of God. I was given an instruction to at all times praise. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. I'm not going to complicate this. I'm going to fill my day with praise. Hallelujah. I've been given an instruction that if I'll ask, I can receive. If I seek, I'll find. If I knock, the door will be open. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask and keep on asking. And my miracle will be on the other side of my obedience to a simple instruction. Come on. Come on, Joy. And here's what Elijah said. This is what's the miracle. Elisha says, tomorrow when you come out, watch this, you will neither hear wind nor will you see rain, but these trenches will be full of water. God can supply the thing you need most without any natural props to make it happen. He doesn't need anything. You say, how do you fill up trenches with no rain? He's God. He's God. What do you need? What do you need? I mean, really, what, what tonight do you need God to do that nobody else can do? It may be that God gives a simple instruction like dig a ditch. But it don't make no sense. No, but when you do what he tells you, you get up in the morning and there's water everywhere. And you don't know how it got there. Hmm? I, I want to close with this. God gave me Several years ago, he gave me just a simple instruction. And he said to me, a certain thing I was to do every time I was in a church service. Every time, do this thing. And I went through a whole series of times where it didn't look like anything was happening. I'll tell you what it was. I don't, I don't always tell it. I'll tell you what it was. I was needing a breakthrough financially in my life for where I wanted to go. See, I think it's amazing that the little country church has paid off all its properties, the camp, the ranch. That's significant. That's a great place to give the Lord great praise. That's significant. That's significant. But can I tell you something? My heart resonated tonight because when the Lord sent me here for these couple of days, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, I'm about to expand their vision to a whole other dimension. He's bigger than you think he is. No, you missed that. I said he's bigger than you think he is. Hmm? And I, I just got a feeling, I don't know, but there's an incredible anointing on, on Pastor Jerry to see people come into the kingdom. And I believe God is about to reach hundreds and thousands of people. And all the people that just want a little gathering are about to be upset. God's about to upset their opera card. Because you, if not, then you have to be the ones who stand at the door and decide which ones go to heaven, which ones go to hell. I don't want to make that decision. Somebody said to me one time, we were believing God to increase and reach our city. And somebody said to me one time, said, I, I'm not interested in numbers. I don't care how many people come to church. Well, I'm not. That, that, that doesn't change what I do. But God's not intimidated by numbers. He's got a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. Right. Why didn't he just say Jesus had some disciples? Why did he say he had 12? Why did he say he fed 5,000? Why didn't he just say he fed a bunch of people one day? All that is is metrics. It helps you measure and see the goodness of what God's done. 
But I needed a financial breakthrough because God had offered to me an opportunity to go international on television all over the world. And I knew my faith wasn't there. And God said to me, I want you to dig some ditches. Dig some ditches. And the first thing he said to me, and I, I, don't, I don't tell this a lot because it's a very personal instruction, but he said to me, he said, I want you to give $100 every time you're in church. Now I want you to understand something. If you only come on Sunday morning, that ain't a bad deal. But I was preaching 300 times a year. And he didn't tell me just every day. He said, every time you preach. And some of those days I was preaching four services. And I said, God, I'm digging ditches because I'm, I'm reaching deep to do something I've never done. And I went through a season of that for about eight months. And I got up one morning and I looked. And unbeknownst to me, in my mail was a contract for literally our television bill was paid for the entire year for 132 nations of the world. I had, I had no clue it was coming. I don't yet know where it came from. Are you with me? Yeah. And God just said to me, your job is to dig the ditches. My job is to provide the water. See, I'm amazed at the number of parents who want children who grow up to serve God, but they don't have time to bring them to a youth meeting on Wednesday night because they're busy. But they'll spend $100,000 to get them off crack, but they won't spend $30 in a gas tank to get them to somewhere to keep them from crack. Come on. How many people? Am I doing all right? Can I keep going? Yes. How many times in our life have we said, God, I want, an, I want an incredible marriage. But you ain't taking your wife on a date in so long that if you ask her, she'd just pass. You'd have to have three ushers to catch her. She'd pass out everywhere. <laughs> God told me not long ago, he said, I told my wife that I love her the day we got married. If I changed my mind, I'd let her know. I said, no wonder you're in trouble. Hmm? How many of you understand all this stuff that we want, we can receive, but we have to learn to dig the ditches. I had a guy say to me one night, I prayed for a man. He was dying with cancer. The doctor had given him four weeks to live. And he walked into a church service just like this. And we were in a season of incredible miracles. We'd had incredible things happen. And he walked down front, and here's what he said to me. And I was, I was fine. I wasn't, the issue to me is not what I'm about to tell you. He walked down and said to me, he said, I want you to pray for me because I'm dying. And he said, I've watched several of my friends get a miracle, and I want you to pray for me. I said, okay, I'm happy to pray for you. He said, but don't put your hands on me because I don't want to fall. I don't want to fall. And I looked at him and something inside of me rose up. And I looked back at him and I said, okay, I want to make sure I understand this before I pray. You'd rather die in four weeks than fall. Explain that to me. And he said, well, I don't guess it really matters, does it? <laughs> and then I explained to him the healing is not in you falling. You don't have to fall to be healed. I just happened to lay hands on some people and the power of God touched them. But the issue is tonight, if that's what it took, are you willing? You say, well, that's not in my theology. Well, praise the Lord. It's not, it's, not, it's not even anywhere in physics that you can make an axe head float. Come on. huh? It's nowhere in oceanography that you can make Red Seas split so people walk through on dry ground. There is nowhere in any science journal whatsoever that you can put mud in blind people's eyes and cause them to see. But when you're willing to dig some ditches, God shows up in a way like never before. Hallelujah.
I got a feeling God over these next couple of nights is about to show up at the little country church and there are going to be incredible supernatural breakthroughs. But tonight we need to dig some ditches. We need to release our faith. We need to say, God, I'm willing to be obedient to whatever we, uh, whatever you tell me. Are you willing to do that? Come on, get on your feet. I want you to just, re- we're going to release a sound in this house. Come on. Come on. I want to hear you praise. Come on. Let something come up out of your insides. Here's what I want to do all over this room tonight. There are only maybe two or three, but I think there's more than that. People who will say, Bishop, that's me. My life is in a major disruption. Everything I thought would happen didn't happen. It didn't, it didn't happen like I thought. And I realize that my need is not a curse. It's a blessing because it's pushing me closer to God. And you're ready tonight to just obey simple instructions, whatever he tells you. You're ready to do that. I want to pray for those people tonight. I just want to agree with you. I'm going to pray a mass prayer and agree with you because it's late. But I'm going to count to three, and if that's you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I want you to take an act of faith, an act of courage. It's going to take courage to do what I'm going to ask you to do. But an act of faith, an act of courage. If that's you, When I get to three, I want you to step out from where you are and meet me right here and say, Bishop, by my walking down this aisle, I'm willing to dig ditches. I'm willing to do whatever I have to do because I need God to show up with water because I've got a need in my life that nobody can solve. I need a supernatural intervention for God to work in my life. When I get to three, if that's you, get down here. We're going to pray and we're going to believe God. One, two, three. Come on right now. Come on. Come on, wherever you are, just come. Just come. Sing one more time, Pastor Joy.
here's what here's what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 1 verse number 19 he said if you be willing and obedient you will eat the good of the land if you be willing and obedient you will eat the good of the land it can be it doesn't even matter what your need is it doesn't matter what matters is how big God is. And he is going to begin to work in your situation. Here's what I'm going to ask you tonight. I don't know what he's going to tell you. Because every person standing here, he may give you a different instruction. For some of you, he may tell you, forgive. It may be an act of unforgiveness that's holding up your miracle. And he may say to you, I want you to go to them and forgive them. It may be that God says to you he wants the first half hour of your day. And you're going to find yourself rolling out of bed 30 minutes earlier than you ever did because you're going to give him the first half hour of your day. And in that, he's going to give you the strategy for how to walk out the miracle you're going to have. It doesn't matter what the instruction is because he gave people all kinds of different instructions. He told a man, go wash in the pool. He told another guy, go show yourself to the priest. The instructions were never the same. What created the miracle was the obedience to the instruction. Because faith always demands corresponding action. We can't say we believe and not be willing to act on what we believe. For most people in this room tonight, the issue is not that we don't have enough information. It's that we don't have enough courage to do what we know. It's not a lack of knowing. It's a lack of doing what we already know. We already know it. I'm going to pray for you tonight. I'm going to ask God that when you go home tonight, when you lay your head on the pillow, God's going to begin to give you instruction. Whatever it is. Simple instruction. And out of that instruction, there's going to come a miracle in your life. Hallelujah. You believe that? I have a lady in my church that the doctors wrote off, said she's finished, she's done. She had a congestive heart, she was failing, and she had uh, pancreatic cancer. The doctor said, you're finished. Go home, make peace with your children, 54 years old. She came to the altar, and I prayed with her, and I said, I don't know what God's going to tell you to do, but I feel strongly God's going to give you an instruction. She went home. Nine months later, she brought me the papers who said, my pancreas is clear. I'm believing God for my heart. That was four years ago. Today, she stands at the front of our church in every worship service, and she jumps and hops and leaps and dances. And people that come in our building say, why do you do that? She said, because I wasn't supposed to make it three months. And so she said, I'm living on over three and a half years of blessed time. Because I obeyed a simple instruction God gave me, the miracle I was looking for. He loves you tonight. Come on, would you lift your hands with me all over the building, Father? In Jesus' name, we declare tonight you are able. Lord, we don't have a question about your ability. We declare you're able. And Lord, I pray over the people that are standing at the front of this church. I believe they're here because of a sincere heart. They have a desire to be willing, and they have a desire to be obedient. Lord, their trust is in you. And we know that you do things by intention. So I'm asking you tonight, give them a simple instruction, whatever the instruction is, that they will believe, and by believing, they'll be changed. And Lord, every act of faith has a corresponding action. And I'm asking you tonight that as they act on what you tell them, their obedience to an instruction is going to give them a miracle. I command sickness, disease, the power of infirmity to be broken in Jesus' name. I command addictions to go, depression to leave people's lives. Lord, all the obstacles that have come into their pathway that's locked them up and kept them from experiencing your goodness. Lord, I thank you for a simple instruction. Tonight, when they lay their head on the pillow, I ask you to speak to them. 
with simple instructions. In Jesus' mighty name. Now I'm going to give you 30 seconds to praise him like you believe it's already happened. Come on, all over the building. Somebody ought to praise him like you believe it's already come to pass. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory. What's your name? What's your name? Kyle? Kyle, God's going to wrap you up in him. Can I just tell you what I, what I see in the spirit? I see that the enemy has come to try to wrap you up in all kinds of stuff to keep you wrapped up. But God's going to unwrap you from grave clothes and he's going to wrap you up in his goodness and in his righteousness. The grave clothes are coming off of you. You're going to be free. In Jesus' name. I know nothing about you, but I see you as a man who's going to be wrapped up in the goodness of God. When people see you coming, they're going to come. Here comes God. The goodness of God's on his life. The goodness of God is on his life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can we believe God that these next couple of nights, we're not here tomorrow night, right? We're off tomorrow night. We rest on Monday. <laughs> Hallelujah. We rest on Monday. Can we believe that Tuesday and Wednesday night, I just, I feel like God's going to have me just pray for a lot of people these next couple of nights. I want you to release your faith with me that God will supernaturally touch people's lives, that people will not go home like they came. Are we in agreement? Yes. Show me that real quick. Just stand right still. Pastor's coming to speak a blessing. I just want to let you know some stuff in the back. There's a whole lot of ministry material in the back. But for those of you that just want something to bolster your faith, this is a, this is a CD called Daybreak. It's a prayer CD that I literally just take people through a prayer process every day. You can just pray with me. There's worship on there. So I lead you in prayer. We go in and out of worship. Literally uh, over 100,000 of these have gone out all over the world. People just use them to pray with. This is called Chosen, Destined to Rule the Nations. If you have children, these are designed for children under 10. If you have children or grandchildren, what you do is you can put it on at night, put it on at nap time, and I just speak over them that they're going, they were born with purpose. They're going to live in purity. God give them parents to help guide their ways. That God was going to work his purposes into their life. You can let them sit down and listen to Veggie Tales and they'll become a cucumber or you can let them listen to the Word. <laughs> this is a healing CD. For those of you that need a physical healing, it's got all the healing scriptures in it from Genesis to Revelation. And about every 10 minutes I make a confession of faith. And believe God. I cannot, we couldn't stack the miracles on this platform right here of people that have written from all over the world that have received a physical miracle. I was with a guy this week in Denton from, from uh, Lincoln, England. His son, 16 years old, was diagnosed with, a, with uh, in, uh, incurable cancer. Behind his eye, he had a brain tumor, 16 years old. And there was nothing the doctors could do they stood up in Denton and made this statement. We put Bishop CD on every single day in our life. Today, David has had a complete miracle. He's 30 years old, and he's got a worship band that travels all over the U.K. and all over America telling the story of how God healed him completely from cancer. He's just had his second baby. It's a miracle of what God's done. If you want teaching material, there's teaching material. All of these are this, the teaching material. Is, this is downloadable material, so you can put it on your iPhone, your whatever material you have. It's called There's a Change in Plans. This is one that's called 10 Things I Learned the Hard Way. If you really want to grow in your leadership, I encourage you to pick it up. Jordan's got a deal at the table tonight. Buy any two things, the third thing's free. Okay, that's my economic stimulus plan. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I love this church. I want you to get ready. We, we're going to dig some ditches. And in the next couple of days, water's going to fill the land everywhere. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Pastor Jerry, thank you. Amen. Woo. That's good tonight. I told you. I don't know. I can't. Sometimes I just want to drag people to church. I really do. Because I, I knew if you could get people here, I knew what would happen to your heart tonight. How effective. Be seated for a brief moment.
I'm going to get our servant leaders to come up and give me a quick hand. The, uh, I think about seven ducks in a muddy pond, in a muddy river. Naaman was a commander-in-chief, and he goes to the prophet. Was it, it was Elijah, though, wasn't it? Was it Elijah or Elisha? Elisha, the same prophet. He said, man, I got, I got leprosy. And little, little servant girl said, I, I know of a prophet that can help you. And he goes, and he says, I, I don't want to come talk to you. Go dip yourself in the muddy Jordan. And he got indignant and upset. Again, the same, same principle, obedience. Just go do something. Show me you'll dig a ditch. You'll dip in the water. And after the seventh dip, he came up with skin like a baby. Amen. It happened. Being obedient. My prayer is that tonight I agree with Bishop. As you get ready to go to bed, you put that head down. Lord, what is it you want me to be obedient in? What is obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. Be obedient to the word of God. Tonight, would you be obedient also in the area of giving? If you need to tie the offering envelope, I would sow into this ministry tonight. I, all that we give toward tonight will go to uh, Bishop Miller. Amen. Joey, so good to have you here. Amen. So good. Come on, y'all give Joey a hand. While... Now, I, my, I have a selfish time, too, because to me, I get an opportunity just to spend a little time with these guys, get to know Jordan. Bishop, talk with him, bounce some things off of him about our future as a church. And Joey with music, you know, I love this, so I'm, I'm excited about having the next few nights with him. It's going to be up to you if it will be successful Tuesday night. I ask you to come back. Kyle, I agree in Jesus' name. The grave clothes are coming off, man. Amen. Good things are happening. But uh, uh, Tuesday night, 7-ish. You know, <laughs> I'll try to be here by 7. It's hard to tell you to be here at 7. I don't show up by 7. But it'll be around 7-ish. But we want, we want the other church folk here. This will bless them. Don't you think, Mitchell? We think it will just revive their faith and believe it. And all of a sudden now disruptions and distractions are not such a bad thing. Amen. It, it's, it, it could be a, a leading to my miracle. It's just, again, how you perceive things. I hope you caught so much of this tonight. I was writing as fast as I could. I'm in my little iPad, man. I'm hitting it, working it, because I want to steal this and put some meat on it and really preach it. Stop the table while you're going back there and pick up uh, some product. Also, look at what you can do for Muscle Car Sunday to help us. We're going to need everybody's help. Amen. Um, Robert Saltz, thanks for spreading mulch for us today. So Sister Tammy and the other secretaries don't have to go out and spread it tomorrow on their off day. Appreciate you doing that. Hey Amen. We're also building a burnout pad for Muscle Car Sunday to do burnouts on. A lot of things coming up toward the car show. Easter going to take care of itself. We're gonna, we'll pack these houses for Easter. We're going to have great services. I'm believing God for a great big net to be cast. Everybody got an envelope that needed one? Amen. Father, we thank you for the gift and the giver and the expectancy that's in this house. Lord, I have an expectancy for a tremendous offering, Lord, to be able to give back that which we've been blessed with. Lord, I thank you to give seed to the sower. I pray that tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, seed will come to sowers that they've never had before, that mir miracles literally financially would move to them. And, God, I know that if you can get it to them, you'll get it through them. Lord, we ask your blessings on this house. In Jesus' name, amen. You can spend your whole life building something from nothing and when storm could come and blow it all away build it anyway you can chase a dream that seems so out of reach and you know it might not ever come your way Dream it anyway. God is great, but sometimes life ain't good. When I pray, it doesn't always turn out like I think it should, but I do. This world's gone crazy and it's hard to believe that tomorrow will be better than today 
believe it anyway you can love someone with your whole heart for all the right reasons one moment they can choose Amen. Now listen. If God can fill a ditch without rain, if he can feed 15,000 with a sack lunch, then I prophesy that if you go to the back room back there tonight and eat, you will not gain weight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I don't want to hear any excuses. I want you, I don't, what, what is the directive here? Do we go down the hall or down the, uh, we're going to go outside. So, Robert, you're going to block that back door for me. We're going to go outside, go in the door. My son Judah is going to lead the way. Judah, would you mind doing that for me, son? You're obedient tonight. God's going to bring your healing even quicker than you ever imagined. So Judah's going to lead the way to the food trough. Lord bless the food, the fellowship, in Jesus' name, amen.